Okay, that looks like that's going. Um, so I'll go ahead and X out of here real quick. And so this is our um, calendar year end page that contains all of our information. Um, so on the left, you are going to see um, our presentation materials for USAS. Um, we have the actual presentation PowerPoint. Um, so that's the first thing that you see there. Um, and that's what I'm gonna be showing you guys in a little bit. Um, our closing procedures is a link there that we have on the wiki. Um, and so this right here is this right here. Um, so really, I haven't really added or changed anything um, in here. Um, the only thing that um, I, make, I may make note of is um, something regarding the F-1099 program, um, but I think we'll just kind of do a wait and see approach um, and if that really needs to be detailed in here. Um, other things that um, uh, we added are some supporting documentation. Um, these are just some of the links on the IRS website um, or the 1220 publication, just more information. The reason we put this on here is just to reference these changes that are being made regarding the 1099 uh, neck form. And so these links here, the first link is just an introductory page, just kind of explaining the difference between the two forms. And then um, the next link is the actual IRS uh, publication for the 1099 miss and 1099 neck. The next one is just the general instructions for information uh, returns and <clears throat> 1099 is part of that. And then the last one is the actual 1220 publication that the IRS has for electronic filing. So that goes into detail about um, the fire system, the test of the fire system and all of that good stuff. So um, we thought we'd provide those for use for easy reference. So we um, put those on this page. And um, when um, Andrea then starts in with the payroll, she'll explain all the uh, different supporting documentation there for all the W-2 stuff. So that's all out there as well as the presentation materials and the closing procedures. So, um, so I just wanted to let you know where all of that's at. Um, the recording, once um, we um, complete this recording today, we'll put this out here as well. So that will be under this link here, recorded webinar. Um, so that in case, you know, someone isn't in the office today or you just want to review a specific sec section of the web webinar, you can. So we'll have that out there for you as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So I'm going to pull up my um, PowerPoint. Okay. And so um, hopefully you guys can all see this okay here. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. And so what we're covering today is the extra um, closing steps. So we'll be going through all of that as well as um, the TR 1099 program. So I know that, you know, we have some newer staff and, um, you know, now that we've got closing procedures for classic and we have closing procedures for the redesign, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had separate webinars for each so that it doesn't get so confusing. Um, so, you know, this today is just a focus on classic. So we aren't going to be going through any redesign changes. It's going to be focused on what has been enhanced in the classic software um, or what's been changed. Um, in regards to calendar year end. Um, so one thing I wanted to make note of regarding USAS is the uh, new forms. So um, this I pulled off the IRS's website uh, regarding submission dates. Um, every year it's been that everything needs to be in by February 1st, by the end of January. And so this is basically telling you that when it comes to the form 1099 NEC, which is non-employee compensation, um, that needs to be filed still uh, by the end of January, either by paper or electronic filing, and that the 1099 miscellaneous forms can be done by March 1st um, if you file on paper or by March 31st if you file electronically. Now, I know you guys are all thinking we're just going to submit everything at the same time. 
that's a good idea um, because um, to, to be able to have to think about, okay, let's do their neck forms by, you know, the end of January, and then they can do their, the rest of their miscellaneous forms and submit that again by, um, you know, March, it's just, it's too much. So um, I, I'm assuming that everyone's just going to try to get everything in and make sure that their districts get everything in by the end of January. But I did want to let you know that you that. IRS is guidelines. So um, I did want to let you know that that's what's out there. Um, I do have some feedback. I'm going to go ahead and see who that might be. Oh. Uh, let's see here. I think we're good now. So if you aren't muted, um, just make sure that you, uh, that you uh, mute your uh, mute yourselves here. Double check in here, make sure. Okay. And so what we're going to cover first is we're going to go through this overview of the calendar year and closing steps. So obviously, not much has changed other than the 1099s. Um, when it comes to the vendor 10, this has been out here for years now, um, but it's always just a good thing to cover, especially with new people coming on board, is that there is a tin type out there on the vendors. And in Classic, it's only in Vend Screen. It's not in USAS Web. And so when they create a new vendor, they have to make sure if this is a 1099 vendor to make sure that the SSN EIN flag is set in Venn screen. And so when they're going in here, they have to either mark it as an S or an E. Um, and this basically defines what the ID number is. Is it their social security number or their employee identification number? Um, so you wanna make sure that those are set. If they aren't, when um, a district runs the 1099 program on the report, it's going to give them an error and tell them that it's not filled in. So it, it does catch it, um, but the districts have to be looking at um, the actual report too. And they can run that whenever they want. Um, if they want to run the F1099 report now, they can. Um, doesn't hurt anything and it gives them a listing of all their 1099 vendors at this point and it's helpful because they'll be able to see if they are missing um, this uh, tin type so um, that's where it's located in Venn screen um, and then another report um, other than just the f1099 report that they can run is the Venn SSN report. So this is a classic report we've had out there for years. Um, and so in this report, um, they can specify um, if they want just 1099 vendors. And so it's going to go out there and pull all of those, 1099 meaning 1099 miscellaneous and NEC. Um, and it's gonna pull all those in, they can choose option four, and it's gonna go out there and just create a report of those 1099 vendors with their year-to-date activity meeting the IRS requirement of $600 or more. Um, option six will in pull, a, pull all 1099 vendors regardless of their year-to-date activity. So if they just have $25, but they're marked as a 1099 vendor, they will be on that report. Um, so this is something they can do ahead of time just to make sure that all of their vendors are accounted for. Another thing, which I don't know how much people do this, but um, they can use option five. Um, and what that will do is allow them to generate a report of all their vendors that are not marked as 1099 vendors with a year to date activity of $600 or more. Um, that's a way for them to review those to say, oh, this vendor should be a 1099 vendor. And then they can go in and, and update the vendor. Um, this report might be pretty lengthy though, depending, um, but um, it is just another way for them to check the data. And then here's a screenshot of the uh, 1099, uh, or I'm sorry, the Venn SSN report. And so it contains the address information um, their ID number, 
and their calendar year to date amount. The one thing that isn't on here um, that is on the F1099 report is the type. So I can't really tell right here what type of vendor it is. Um, so that's something obviously we're not going to change on this report, um, but it's just another option. If you want to run this ahead of time and take a look, um, the VEN SSN would be a good report to review this information. If they prefer to run the F1099 report as many times as they want to, to look at what's out there, they can do that as well. But again, that is only going to pull anything that's marked with a 1099 type um, that's over $600. So this one is gonna give them the option to do any, anything you know, under 600, all you know, 1099 vendors. So this gives them a few more options. So um, vendor names here. Um, if the vendor uses a different name for 1099 reporting, um, the district can enter that name in the name to field um, in UCS web and Ben screen, wherever they um, maintain that information. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to enter in the digits 1099 colon followed by that IRS name that they want to use. What happens then is the F1099 program will strip off the 1099 colon and just use that name as the primary name on the 1099 form and for the 1099 submissions. So let me show you what that looks like here. And so here is kind of an example. Um, so I've got ABC Consulting as the name. And then my second name, I have 1099 Fran Smith. So Fran Smith is the IRS name that I want to report. ABC Consulting is the business. Um, but I want to report the individual to the IRS. So what I have here is I put the 1099 colon, colon in front of Fran's name on the second name field. And so we provided an example of what it looks like um, on the actual purchase order. So right now, this is what they are going to see if they have it entered in this way. Um, but on the actual 1099 form, obviously ABC Consulting is not listed on there, just Fran Smith. Um, if they don't care for this to be on here all year, um, they can go in and you know temporarily make the change on the vendor file. And then after they're done with the 1099s, go back in and update the vendor again. So it's, it's their preference on how they wanna do that. Um, this hasn't changed. This has been this way for years, um, but we just wanted to let you know, you know, what that 1099 colon will do. Um, this information right here is just showing you the um, fields that are involved with the 1099 program. So it's basically going in and just um, I've highlighted the actual fields that are included in here. Um, so the name and obviously the second name, which has the 1099, um, those are included and get pulled in to the F1099 program. The 1099 information down here. Um, and so we got the 1099 type, the ID and the override. So if the override flag is set and let's say their calendar year to date amount is $100. Um, if you set it to override, that vendor is going to get pulled into the F-1099 because you're overriding the $600 threshold. So you want to include that person in, even though their year-to-date amounts are less than $600. That's what that override does. Um, and then obviously on the amounts, it's the calendar year-to-date amount that is going to get pulled in. So this is a modifiable field too. Um, so if you have a, a district call and say, you know, my year-to-date amount is 2000, um, but really um, they should be reporting, you know, 1600 to the IRS. They can go into the vendor here and modify that year-to-date amount and, and put in $1,600. And that's the amount then that's gonna get pulled in to the F-1099 report. I don't see any questions so far, so I'll keep going. Um, so um, any, any uh, questions regarding um, just like the preliminary steps for 1099s, running the VEN SSN or 
questions on the EIN um, the, or the SSN, the tintype. So if no questions, I'll go ahead and continue on. Okay, the month end closing. Um, I know some of you are like, oh, she's going to go through month end. Um, but, you know, there are new people on. So I just want to go through the classic month end steps. Obviously, nothing's changed, but I just want to explain them. Um, so obviously, they're going to proceed with closing out um, for the month of December as normal. So they'll enter all their transactions for December to get that all completed. And we do have a bank reconciliation procedure that is out there in the user guide. It's under the useful USAS procedures chapter. I'm sure all districts have their own bank reconciliation procedure, but we do have a generic procedure out there. Um, it also has information on if they aren't balancing and the system's higher than the bank or vice versa. It has tips and tricks out there too to help a district. So that's all out there in the user guide. Um, so they want to examine their reports to ensure that they're in balance. So they're going to use the USA EMS EDT cash rec um, and enter in their reconciliation information for December and make sure that that's balanced with the system um, amounts. Uh, they are going to run a PO detail report of outstanding purchase orders. And when they run a bell check, um, the outstanding encumbered amount should agree with that PO detail encumbrance. So those should match. And if for some reason they don't, um, they can run fixed encumbrance, which recalculates encumbrances on the system um, to, make, to see if that would fix it. If they don't, they'll be contacting you. And if you need help, you can submit a ticket and we'll help you out. Um, other things with Balcheck, um, Balcheck is a balancing program um, based on time frames. So it's going to show month to date, fiscal to date, year to date expended amounts on accounts. So on the cash account, on the appropriation, uh, the budget, and the revenue accounts. So it's going to show that information and just make sure that those are all in check and those are all in balance. So um, that's really a, a good balancing program a report to run at the end of every month, um, just to ensure that everything looks good. You know, with Classic, they're stored amounts. Uh, redesign, they're all calculated on the fly. So, you know, if something happened and an amount didn't update properly in Classic, that's why we have to have the bell check report, just to ensure that everything's in balance. Um, running FinSum. So FinSum is your cash summary report in Classic. And so what we recommend you do is selecting yes um, to generate FinDebt at the same time. So that's going to run those two reports at the same time. And the ending balances are displayed at the end of the report run on the screen showing the balance for the FinSum and the FinDebt. And those should be identical. So if they aren't, there's a problem. And that's something that needs to be looked at before they continue on. Um, and obviously, when those run, then you'll get two separate report files. You'll get a FinSum.txt and a FinDetail.txt, and those can be reviewed as well. Um, but we highly recommend to make sure that the FinDebt is run at the same time. The FinDebt's looking at the transaction data. It's looking at all of those detailed transaction amounts. And the FinSum is looking at the account and the account amounts. So running these two reports at the same time ensures that whatever is out there on the account file, those amounts are matching what's on the transactions. Uh, so make sure those amounts are the same. Um, so that's uh, one report that will take care of that. Uh, running the SM2 calc. Um, so districts can run this ahead of time. Um, and then they run the calc option, it'll calculate the SM2 and they can review that. Um, if they don't run it, that's okay because when they run adjust at the end of the month, um, it will calculate the SM2 and plug those um, SM2 figures into the SM2 main program. So um, it does do it automatically when they run adjust. Uh, monthly CD, want to make sure that they're running monthly CD to generate their December reports and uh, they should be going out there and looking at that um, after it's generated, maybe the next day, make sure that everything looks good and um, 
December's reports have been generated. This is just a list of the minimum reports um, that are recommended. Um, if they have any additional calendar year and reports that they want to run, they can run those as well. Um, we also have, um, or um, we also recommend that um, you can create a copy of their calendar year end files if you want to. So if you have some type of procedure that you want to run to back up a copy of their calendar year end information, um, you can do that. So if you don't have one and you're like, mm, how do I do that? Um, create a ticket. We'll help you with that. There is, a, I think, a calcopy.com procedure we have <clears throat> that um, you should be able to use and it will generate a copy of all those IDX and REL files. I'm sure most of you have that already in place. It's been like that for years, but if you haven't been doing that, then, um, you know, that's a, probably a good idea to do. Um, running the VH reset from the Venn Hire program, uh, Districts should be going out there um, and periodically running uh, the Venn Hire report just to go out there to see if there are vendors that meet that $2,500 threshold um, to be reported to the new hire reporting center. Um, and what this option does is the VH reset option in Venn Hire is going to take all of those vendors that were flagged as reported in calendar year 20 and set them back to a reportable status. So they're set to go for calendar year 2021. And so um, what happens is you get an output file here and it will just show those vendors that are gonna be reset back to a reportable status. So when those vendors do meet that $2,500 um, threshold again, so they, you cut checks against those independent contractors mainly, for more than $2,500 um, when you run the Venn Hire report, maybe it's in July or something, you run the Venn Hire report, it will place that vendor on the report to show that you know it's met the $2,500. You run the report, it's gonna mark them then as reported and you submit that report to the Venn Hire uh, Center. So again, at the end of the next year then, you would use this option again to reset them again. So these are for your, you know, your independent contractors, your 1099 type vendors. Once that's done, um, you run adjust and you're going to select month end. Um, and obviously when they are running adjust, you want to make sure that no one else is in the programs when they're running it. And so that will officially close them out for the month of December. And then the next um, few steps are um, other things that need to be done at calendar year end time. So obviously running the F1099 program um, needs to be done to create the 1099s for the current calendar year. And again, anything I have in red just kind of points out, you know, changes that are being made. So like I said, the IRS is implementing the 1099 NEC. Um, and so we are working on them. I wish I could show it to you today and run the F-1099 program and show you the changes, but I can't because they haven't started, or I think they're in the process of um, making those changes to the classic F-1099 program. So I do have a JIRA issue listed, listed here. Um, if you wanna see more details, I have outlined some of those details in the upcoming slides here, but um, USAS V636 is the JIRA issue um, that they're going to be working on to make those changes. Um, so the F-1099 program has both the 1099 NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous forms. So just to um, highlight the changes on that JIRA issue. Um, so they, have the, they will have the ability to run the F-1099 program for all types. So that would include NEC and miscellaneous. They will have the ability to run the program just for NEC or just for miscellaneous. And that's based on IRS, um, what they have stated. So we made sure that our program is working the same way. Um, they have the ability to, to generate separate print files for the 1099 MIS and the 1099 NEC. 
Um, and then those, you know, will be compatible with um, the accountability software. Um, we are, have been in touch with um, Edge regarding the changes. So um, Jody is keeping, I think, Liz from Edge updated. Um, so, um, and she's got, a, a, I think, a link on the wiki there that she has this information out there. So Liz can go test them and make sure that everything looks good. So, so we are in communication with them. Uh, the F1099 text file. Um, just for those of you that may be new um, and not sure what the F1099 program does in the first place, um, it sorts by 1099 type. So if a district generates both types at the same time, the NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous, the NEC vendors will be listed first. That's what they're planning on doing and told, and then the remaining miscellaneous vendors with a separate total. And then I believe they'll have a grand total at the bottom. Um, so that's, I think, the plan of how they're going to change, update the 1099 uh, report. Um, the 1099 DAT file should contain the same vendors that the tape file contains and sorted so that the neck vendors are first and then the miscellaneous vendors if they're all combined on one file. So, um, so that's how that's going to roll out. The 1099 form file, um, this is a file that I don't really know how many people use anymore because it's to be on printed um, pin fed forms, which I believe we're all using the uh, pressure sealed Z fold forms for our 1099s. Um, but um, so they are going to make sure that this is updated as well. And then the 1099 tape file is the submission file that's going to go to the IRS. So again, all 1099 types can be in this file, or it can be just NEC or MIS, depending on what they select in the 1099 program. Um, and so that's um, how that's going to get updated. So like I said, I know that I wish I could show it to you, um, but um, once the developers have completed the changes to the F1099 program, we are going to record a demo of the program changes. So I think we'll just do a recording of here's the 1099 and run through the 1099 options, how to run it if you want to include both NEC and miscellaneous, or if you just want to do NEC or miscellaneous. So we'll run through scenarios of those, um, record that, and send that off to you guys. So you guys can review it then and say, okay, this is how it's supposed to work. Um, and then you know, if it's something you want to forward on to your districts, you can. Um, but um, I know that they're planning on releasing the December release in early December is what the plan is. Um, so hopefully within the next month, we'll have that information out to you guys. Um, any questions? I do see one here. Would you recommend doing all neck first, then miscellaneous? Um, John, I, re I recommend, I think what you guys are going to be doing is doing all. You're going to be doing, um, I think your districts are going to be running both NEC and miscellaneous together. Um, I feel like that's going to be easiest for you guys. That way, all of them are on the one file. They all get submitted at the same time. They all get printed at the same time. It just makes it easier. So, I wouldn't be changing what you guys did last year. Um, I think that, you know, you probably want to keep things the way they are. It's just that it's going to look different on the form files. You know, it's going to look different on the report, um, but I would include everybody. So. You're welcome. Um, so this is just, again, a review of the output files. Um, and I just kind of talked about the changes of these output files, but just to review again what these do, when they run the F1099 program, they get four files. They get the text file, which is the report of their 1099 vendors. So that's just for them to review. And like I said, they can go in and run the F1099 program as much as they want. There is an option in there that asks them if they want to generate the tape file. And if they're just wanting to run the report just as a preliminary step, they can say no to that. Um, so a tape file doesn't get created. 
um, it will create the rest of these output files. But if they just want to check their 1099s, just to make sure like that tin type is set and that things are reported correctly, this person's neck versus this person's miscellaneous, um, then definitely run this report and it will go out there and, and they can review it as many times as they want to before they're re ready to actually do their actual run of their 1099s. Um, the F1099 DAT file, that's the file that's going to be used with Edge's accountability software. So this will be used with those pressure seal laser generated forms. So you're going to be doing the same thing that you did last year and pulling that into the accountability software and printing those out in the pressure seal, sealing, sealing them and sending them out um, so to the districts to distribute. Um, so that, you know, um, is still the same DAT form. Uh, the FRM, like I said, I don't think anyone's using these. These are the printed, um, to be printed on the pin fed forms. So they're blank forms um, or forms that are, you know, have just the shell of the 1099, but it's on the, the hold pin fed. So I think we've all um, updated or upgraded from that. So I don't think anyone really uses these anymore. Um, the F1099 tape is the submission file. So this is the file that you're going to go and append um, all of your district's tape files together. Um, and then you're going to take that and run it through the TR1099 program. So that's the file you're going to use there. Um, I have another question here. Uh, we will, will we get different DAT files for the NEC versus the miscellaneous? Um, I believe so. Um, so because they're going to be different formats, um, I think that's how that's planning, uh, they're planning to do it in classic. So I'm not sure what the names are going to be. But again, once we find out, once they um, make the updates to the F1099 program, we will demo that on that on that recording and make sure that you guys have that information. Um, Pat also made a note here that we will have examples of both forms in the redesign. So that one is done. So we do have the changes made to the 1099 option in redesign. And Pat will go through that next week and show you guys how that looks in the redesign. So that one's finished. Classic. Um, I know that the developers have been so busy with the W2 changes in Classic. That came first. And then these updates to the 1099 are next. So, um, so like I said, those should be out here hopefully within the next month. Um, districts, um, once you're done with, uh, once they're done with completing their 1099 information, you know, they'll get all the output files and they, or you should have it on your checklist that they need to notify you when they're done running the F1099 program. That way, you know, you know, that they're done with the files, you can go in and pull the DAT files and the tape files and, um, and go through your steps to, to print them off and to submit that to the IRS. Um, once the 1099 and the VH reset options are done, um, the next thing is to run adjust uh, again. So you ran it once for month end, and now you're going to run it again um, for the calendar. So there's a year end option, and then under year end, you got fiscal or calendar to choose from. So obviously, you're going to pick the calendar. And again, everyone should be out of the files when this is run. What happens then is that that clears out everything for calendar year end. So that clears out the year to date totals, the calendar year to date totals, and all of that's um, cleared out. And basically, they're ready to begin processing now for January. One other thing I wanted to know, and I keep forgetting to put it on this slide, but we've got a couple questions. Um, let me see if I can pull this over. We received a couple questions regarding. go back into my account. What I'm doing is I'm going into um, the USA Con. And one thing I wanted to make note of, and I think I'm going to add that to this slide, is that um, we've had a couple questions here just lately about the EMIS reporting year that's showing down here. And sorry, but my 
test files are a little old. Um, but when you run adjust at calendar year end time, it's going to automatically change the EMIS reporting year for you. Um, so that's going to go out there in USA Con. And right now, everyone's just showing 2020 from last fiscal year. Um, and so when you run adjust for calendar year end, it's going to go out there and update that to 2021. So when you're ready then to run your EMIS related uh, um, submissions and um, reports and stuff like that for classic at the end of fiscal year 2021, the reporting year will be correct. So you usually do not have to go in here and update this. This should get updated when you run calendar year end. So I know this is more of a fiscal year end year, but um, we felt like it would be easier to have another program just automatically update it. And we thought calendar year end was a good time to do that. So that then when you're ready to run your EMIS uh, related USA EMS and all of that stuff at fiscal year end and classic, that reporting year will automatically reflect 2021. So, so right now everybody should say 2020. And if uh, it's February or March and you're going in and you're seeing in a district's files, huh, it still shows 2020. I'm guaranteeing that they forgot to run calendar year end adjust and that's okay. We do have procedures to update that. Um, if that does happen and you're like, yeah, it's not showing 2021, um, then it's probably because they forgot to run calendar year and adjust and there are ways for us to fix that. Obviously that will, you don't want to run calendar year adjust in February. Um, but um, you create a ticket to us and we'll help you out. We do have procedures that you can uh, recalculate the year-to-date amounts because if they never ran calendar year end adjust, the year-to-date amounts are still carrying everything from last year plus what they've done January and February. Um, so there is a way to clear those and recalculate those and as well as the vendors, because it's just not the year-to-date amounts, it's the vendor year-to-date amounts as well, not just accounts, but vendors. We can, there's a vendor year-to-date program that will recalculate those, and then he would be manually going in here and updating this, but, you know, kind of went off on a tangent there, but um, just to, I know we get questions and tickets saying, yeah, it's still showing 2020. Um, so I just wanted to let you know probably the reason why, so. Um, so once they're done then and they run calendar year and adjust, um, they can begin processing for January. So it should be set. Uh, the 1099 um, submissions, this is just, again, um, just notes uh, regarding it. Uh, recommendation, if you electrically, electronically submit your 1099 data on behalf of your district, you're using the IRS fire system. So if you do, we recommend you setting your own deadline with your districts to notify you um, when they've completed the F-1099 program. You've got to the end of January, you know, if you're gonna do everything together, just like you did last year. Um, so if you need to have everything submitted to the IRS by January 31st, your districts need to be giving you their 1099 stuff ahead of time. So you got time to print their 1099s append their tape file and get it all ready to go to submit it to the IRS fire system. So you do need to make sure in your checklist that you're setting your own deadline, you know, a few days in advance um, to say you need to have your 1099 stuff to us by this date. So just to give you guys a window of time to get everything ready. And I just have the reminder of the submission dates here again per IRS. Um, requirements. Like I said, you know, and some of you have already asked, um, is it, a, should we do them separately? I wouldn't. I'd make them do all their 1099s at the same time, regardless of their neck or miscellaneous. Just get them all done at the same time, just like you have in prior years. So giving them that much flexibility just makes it harder to keep track. So, um, and then this link here is just, it's one of those links that was out there on the SSDT training page, um, just instructions. It's just basically introductory material, just familiarizing you with the 1099 miss and the 1099 neck information. So 
Um, these are just going through some general 1099 procedures. So, you know, after the district runs their 1099, the F1099 program, like I said, they get those output files and uh, they want to just look that over definitely and make sure that everything looks good. And you want to also just kind of review it. Um, I know that um, when I used to work for Nawaka, we would look at the 1099 report and just scan through it and make sure that an EIN um, or an SSN, that tin type wasn't, was, uh, there weren't any errors saying that they were missing. Um, so because it shows it right there on the 1099 report and you know the district should be looking at that but in case they miss it you know you, you're kind of the backup to say oh you guys you know missed one so they would need to go in to that vendor um, enter in that tin type and then rerun the F1099 program and then you know you can review that again and make sure that everything looks good. So um, you may rename the files to a different extension in order to save them later. So if you guys have a little procedure that takes those you know, text files and the tape file and the form file and the DAT file and rename them to a different extension and archive them somewhere, then you certainly can do that. And then like I said before, the 1099 DAT file is going to be used with the, S with the Edge software to generate the 1099 forms. So I'm assuming that, like I said, there's going to be a NEC and a 1099 DAT file. So there'd be two separate files because they're two separate forms. And obviously they go into the accountability software separately as well to print those out. Um, so I don't believe in um, classic, they're going to be all under the same one. So, but again, we will get that confirmed once they make the changes to the F1099 program. Um, so if you are printing, which I believe um, most of you, I think all of you are printing your 1099s on behalf of your district, um, just some things that you could include. Um, a copy of the F1099 report. Um, obviously the pressure sealed, ready to go 1099s and a vendor copy, which you can print on just regular eight and a half by 11 paper so that the districts have their copy and instructions on how to distribute the 1099s. So once the 1099s gets into the district's hands, what do they do with them? So, um, so those instructions should be provided. Okay, any other questions regarding um, the F1099 program? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move on with the uh, <clears throat> TR-1099 program. So once all the dis you know, districts are sending you, you know, their email saying, yep, my 1099s are done, you're going out there and ensuring that those tape files have been created um, for each district, that they've created those. And then you're gonna take that and you're going to append them and run it, the appended file through this TR-1099. This gets the file ready to submit to the IRS fire system is what this is doing. Um, and so this is just a screenshot of the 1099 reporting requirements. Again, I'm just putting this stuff out here again um, and their due dates and, and all of that. So this is just more of an FYI. And then um, this is something that changed last year um, but I believe all of you already have your, you guys have been submitting forever for your districts um, in classic. And so um, with classic submissions, you're still going to be submitting, submitting their classic data. Um, <clears throat> but um, last year um, for first time transmitters, they had to um, electric, electronically file their form 4419 uh, when requesting an original TCC. So, um, so that's just information from last year regarding all of this. Um, so you guys, everyone, you know, whoever was a first time transmitter, um, you know, if there were any, they would have had to have done this last year. So everyone should be good to go for this year. This is just more of an FYI. Uh, one thing that uh, we do recommend, um, I mean, and, you know, I don't want to tell the ITC 
you know, what they need to do, but it's just a good recommendation is to create a test file for the fire system. Um, and I believe most of you are doing this anyways, um, just to make sure that mm, everything's looking good so that you're ready to go. Uh, because we have that limited window, you know, of trying to get everything out by the end of January, running a test file in like November now, um, just as in ensures that everything's good to go so that when you're ready to do it at the end of January, everything's good. So if you've never submitted before, um, a test to file is required before you do the actual submission. Um, and so this has more information. Um, and this is because of the combined federal state reporting program. So we've got a link here uh, regarding that. Um, but you know, it, it, you do have to um, if you've never submitted a test file before, or if you've never submitted before, a test file is required before the first submission. Like I said, you're all fine with that. You guys have been submitting stuff for your ITCs or for your districts uh, for a number of years, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, following the normal TR-1099 submission instructions, um, that's basically what this test file is doing. It's following those, so um, and it has it listed in there in I believe publication 1220 where it talks more about submitting a test file um, and it just talks about the things that need to be done in order to run the test file. So right here you may include one or more districts 1099 files. Um, so you need to pick an actual district's data. Um, then you're, it must be at least 11 vendors. Um, you must, when you're running it, the TR-1099, you must, must, must enter test because this is a test submission. And it's even in a separate uh, website. So you got the IRS fire and then you got the IRS fire test. Um, so when you're creating a test file via TR-1099, then you're going to submit it through the fire test system, this URL right here. So right now, I believe they opened up the window at the beginning of this week um, to submit test files. So this information um, I have on the next screen, actually, the dates. So um, you will receive an approval letter or email from the IRS um, uh, so that you know it will tell you if it was successful or not. So um, that's all listed in there as well. This is the actual. Um, these are the actual dates for the fire system and then the fire test system. So you'll see in the test submission here that it's available now through December. So you can submit a test file between this time frame here. And then the actual fire system is showing you when that is available. So. So after you do the test submission then, and you get an email back saying everything looks good, then um, you're ready to go for the end of January. So you're ready to do that actual or what it's called in the TR 1099 system original. Um, and so that original submission then um, will have to be done via um, the fire system. So you did the fire test for the test and for the original, you're going in the actual fire system. And I'm sure you guys have your, you know, logins and all of that. Um, I don't know. I think it may make you change or can't make you change your password every year. I can't remember. Um, but um, all of that, you know, is stuff that you already have on file from last year. So your TCC code, all of that, it's all ready to go so that you're ready to submit their classic data. Now, what we're going to talk about next week is submissions when it comes to submitting is that redesigned districts have the ability to submit their own data. You guys still have to print the 1099s, but they can submit their data on their own. And we will go through all of that next week. Um, but when it comes to classic, you're still doing the submissions. Um, this right here is just talking about the append process. So like I said, um, you're going to have a bunch of tape files coming in from your classic districts. And what you're going to do then is you're going to take those and append them. 
And so this is an append procedure you can do on the BMS system to append all of those. So if you kind of look at this, he's obviously got the word append and then whatever disk drive that's on. Um, and then you're going in and saying, if you've got um, you know, several of your districts on one disk drive and you're saying, take you know, so-and-so districts, f1099.tape file. So this could be multiple districts. And then here's the next disk drive with more. Um, you're basically saying, take all of those tape files and append them to this name, this file name. And so basically it's going to create this F1099 file or whatever name you want to give it. Um, and that's the one, excuse me, and that's the one that you are going to then enter in to the TR1099 program. So it's an appended file of all the 1099 data. Um, and then, like I said, the TR1099 will take that and format it to the correct format that the IRS fire system will accept. So it gets it all ready to go. So this is a program run. Um, let's see here. Will the 1099 NEC uh, need to be ready before we can submit a test? We are actually um, testing that. Um, so we're in the process of getting those tested um, to make sure. Um, as for you guys being able to do that, obviously right now you're not. We're doing it on our end to make sure that the NEC file goes through okay through the IRS website. So SSDT is kind of taking care of that. So when you're doing your test submission, um, right now you're not gonna have that form um, because the window's right now. So you can do the regular miscellaneous submission. If it's done before then, then yeah, you can go and do a test on the NEC file as well. Um, but for right now, um, it, you won't be able to until those changes get made. Um, running the TR-1099 program, um, these are just some of the um, outputs or the prompts, I guess, if you will, that you're going to get. Um, so you're going to put in the appended file name, whatever you named that when you did the append process. Um, it's going to create an output file name um, and then just the information that's in here. So the company transmitter's name, that would be the um, ITC, your information your contact information in case there are questions, email address, um, just in case there is a problem with the transmission, um, the type of file. So obviously when it comes to the test submission, you're gonna select the test. When you're ready to do the actual submission, it's original. Um, the transmitter code is your TCC code. Are you approved for combined federal state filing? That was supposed to be done years ago. So I'm assuming everyone's still good to go. And then if for some reason you're doing this for the prior year, um, you'd enter in a P only if you're doing something that you need to make a correction or something from the prior year. Otherwise, you guys will not be doing this um, for your test or for your um, original submission. So you can just skip over that. Um, when it generates then and it completes, you get a TR-1099 text file, which is a summary report of all of your districts on there and the number of 1099s um, that is included on that output file. Um, we recommend that you keep the, uh, the TR-1099 file on, rec on file um, and store that. And then obviously you get the output file. So that's the file then, that's the golden ticket. That's what you're going to um, submit to the IRS fire system. So you'll get two output files, the TR-1099 text, and then I'm gonna go back up, whatever you named the output file. So this example, IRS tax.dat file. So that would be this output file here. Um, and so this is just a review of completing the transmittal. So you're gonna take that DAP file that was generated from TR-1099 and go in and um, log into the fire system and submit it. 
So um, like I said, this wouldn't be, I mean, this isn't going to be different from what you guys did last year. So, you know, when you think about the 1099 neck versus the 1099 miss, those, if you're um, running the F-1099 program to have everything together, then all of those, both the neck and the other miscellaneous will all be on the same tape file together. And so, and then those tape files are all appended. So everything, both neck and miscellaneous are included. So it's not like you're, you're gonna have to have a separate file here for that. Um, those are all included together on the tape file. They get appended into one file and that file gets um, submitted to the IRS fire system, both your neck and 1099 information all get submitted together. And then obviously it's been a while since <laughs> I've done one of these. I'm trying to remember when I was with Nawaka, um, I think you get like uh, a status report back saying, you know, that it was a good file or if there was a problem, you'd get a bad file. Um, so you'll get emails and stuff kind of letting you know um, that the submission was successful, that it was good or bad. So, um, so we just keep a copy of those um, reports and stuff for your records so that you have that on record that, yep, everything went through okay. IRS said everything looked good and just keep that on file so you have that. Okay, any questions about TR-1099 or the um, fire system? I just wanna say that that publication 1220 is very helpful. Um, reading through that, it goes through everything regarding the fire system, how to do a test submission, how to do the original submission, information about the TCC codes, all of that is listed in that publication 1220. Um, and so it's got a lot of good information. We use um, the file layout structures in the 1220. SSDT has to uh, reference those in order to get the format correct and set up correctly for you guys to submit it to IRS. So, you know, the first half of that publication is really helpful for the ITC. The second half is extremely helpful for SSDT in order for us to, you know, update software. So um, it's a good document. Um, just a couple other things here um, is uh, updates to um, that we've made in classic since fiscal year end. So, you know, we don't get much uh, anymore with the classic updates. We're basically fixing things or having to add things because in this case, uh, your state's office um, has a new fund. So I just wanted to, you know, make sure that, you know, we only had a couple updates since fiscal year end, but I just wanted to bring these to you guys' attention. Um, so first off, um, back in July, I made sure I put the dates here. Um, we sent out a message regarding the 510 Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, lots of funds added this year because of COVID. Um, we had some in May, um, so before fiscal year end, 507, 508, 509, and then the 510 was added after fiscal year end. And also um, removing fund 467 from this fund info XML, we put that in there um, thinking that there needed to be an EMIS fund category um, for the 467 and there doesn't. Um, so during fiscal year end, everyone was getting warnings and stuff saying they had to put, you know, an EMIS fund category in for the 467 and you didn't. So we made sure that we corrected that um, so that you didn't get those warning messages anymore. So that's one thing we did back in July. Um, the other thing we did um, is we also had to update USAS web regarding the 467 fund as well. So we made some updates there. And I believe that's all we really did in classic um, this past year. Um, but like I said, the other change to be made in classic is the F1099 uh, program. So once we get that um, completed, like I said, I'd like to do, I think maybe doing a recording. I don't know if you guys, you know, do you guys recommend something different in chat? But I just thought maybe doing a recording of, of, of us going through showing the screen of the F1099 program and kind of demoing what it's going to look like and kind of explaining the options would be the best route to go. And then we'll post that 
you know, on our wiki or on our YouTube channel or something um, that you guys can reference and then just pass on um, to your districts if you if you want to. But we just, you know, I just thought it'd be easier than trying to get you guys all together again during this busy time and doing another uh, Friday session. I just thought a quick demo of the changes in the F-1099 will probably do. So if you guys feel like you wanted an actual training session more on that, let me know, but um, that's our plan. So um, next week, we are gonna be going through the calendar year-end USAS um, updates for redesign. Um, so both payroll and USAS um, will be starting there next Friday at nine o'clock. So that information is already out there, the registration link, and then our webinar materials for that are provided in here as well. Um, so excited to share all that stuff with you guys in there as well. And like I said, we do have the 1099 updates made in redesign. So Pat will be able to show you what it's gonna look like. Um, so um, that'll be pretty sweet. So it'll help a little bit, make a little more sense. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Okay, I don't see anything in chat. Well, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing here and Andrea is going to start back up. Um, let's give you guys uh, a quick uh, stretch break here uh, because I know Andrea has a lot to get through with the tent. Yes, we do. Changes. <laughs> right, Andrea? <laughs> so let's give so, you guys like a five minute break here and then we'll meet back and go through the payroll changes. Thank you. Michelle, did you say five minutes? Yes, five minutes. Five, yep. Okay, so about five after 10, I'll start yep. back up. Well, I'll, send that, I'll send a chat message here just to let everybody know. Okay. How about 10-10? How's that sound? 10-10 works for me. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, I sure can. Awesome. Let me know when you have it recorded. We're good to go. I've got it back on. You got it back on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started for our calendar year end for um, 2020. Um, like Michelle said, we do have a lot of new updates this year um, with the COVID being added to the 001 federal um, deduction screen and um, with the new state, surrounding states of Ohio that now um, the ITCs can um, create the tapes and submit for their employees districts, for the districts that have those employees. So we'll be going through that at the end of um, the presentation. So for right now, we're gonna be just going over normal review of what we, um, what really, uh, nothing new from the years before, but just what those new ones at the end. So, so go ahead and we'll get started. Um, Again, your deadline for filing. So you wanna make sure that you get all your files into um, IRS by January 31st. Um, again, um, your districts will wanna make sure that they run this W2 mate um, before they get started uh, to make sure